Hi, this is Gregor from Paradise Lost, and I'm blowing it up on Metal Gods Radio. This is the Mighty Z, a.k.a. Zoran Theodorovich of Metal Gods Radio, and we have Greg McIntosh of Paradise Lost on the phone with us. How are you doing this morning? I'm pretty good. Not too bad at all. I mean, considering the lockdown and everything, it's, uh, it's not that bad. It's pretty weird not touring, but um, apart from that, being at home... Is not all that bad, really. What is the most uh, amount of time uh, you've had between touring in the last 15 years? Probably, actually, if you if you take it 30 years, I probably haven't had more than three weeks off from a show. Wow, that's quite the change to yeah, th th three months off. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's kind of a bizarre lifestyle change. It's like. The first few weeks, I, I, maybe maybe it was like this for a lot of people, but the first few weeks, I, it was kind of like couldn't get motivated or anything, and like just stayed in the pajamas for like two weeks or something, and then slowly kind of got more more motivated to do things, I suppose. And uh, I know, like I'm married, and you, I believe you are married, and you have children, but yeah, uh, but my my children are grown up, though. Oh, okay. Congratulations. Uh, okay. Do you have kids? I don't have kids, but I am married. Oh, okay. Congratulations on that point. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, the, there does, there's a, even though we have uh, significant others that we probably get along with pretty well, um, mm -hmm. there is a certain loneliness that starts to set in, even uh, a depression of sorts. Um, I, I think it can. I think it can do. I mean, it's it's just this. I think it's this thought that you don't know when the end is going of this is going to be or or um, whether things will go fully back to normal. So it's kind of this thing where you don't have an end goal um, that maybe you would have had before. So I think that's that, that kind of makes you a little bit more apathetic than maybe you wouldn't normally be. And uh, the UK, like America, is slowly opening back up. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but they keep kind of changing their mind every day. It keeps, it keeps altering slightly. Um, I'm sure it's different state to state in America. I mean, with the UK being so small, at least we only have one point of reference, I suppose. Here in America, the whole thing has become uh, political now. It's not really, uh, um, not with many people, it's not so much a health issue. It's now become an attack on, um, you know, like for instance, uh, people now uh, consider wearing a mask as an attack on Trump, is it? Has it become like that over there as well? No. An atta attack on no. Boris? No. No, not at all. I mean, nothing, nothing to that degree. I'm, I think that's just because of Trump's polarizing, you know, polarizing methods and stuff. I, th I think that's the only reason for that. I th I, no, I mean, if it's in the UK, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of self policing going on, which you've got to question slightly, um, but. Apart from that, I mean, people have been fairly sensible apart from the odd wankers, you know what I mean? But, um, but I mean, no, 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 the, the American thing, I mean, you can, you, I mean, in any situation like these, I mean, this is unprecedented, but in, in a lot of situations, similar-ish, people always find some way to turn, turn it around and use it for their own ends, you know? So, first of all, the new album, Obsidian, is amazing. You must be very proud of yourself. Oh, thanks, mate. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm quite proud of it. I, I, I had no idea that it was going to get received so well. Um, so it's kind of uh, taken me a little off guard. But so did the last, so did the last album that we did, and it's a step up from that one again. So uh, it seems weird at this, like you know, 30-year career that then all of a sudden you know people are, I don't know, it's like another upturn again. So it's uh, yeah, very proud. Do you uh, do you read reviews, and uh, have you uh, do you find them useful? Um, I don't go looking for them, um, but I, I, I often get sent some reviews now and again. Um, and no, they're more flattering than useful. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're useful at all because I, I don't really take on board uh, too much uh, one person's opinion above anyone else's really. You know, it's, uh, because music's very subjective. It's nice, it's nice when you get uh, praise, but... Um, yeah, you can't you can't get too wrapped up in it. I don't think. How important is coffee in the morning? 
Um, I, I only have one cup of coffee a day, and it's very important. It's part of the route. I don't think it's to do with the caffeine for me. I think it's just part of the routine, you know. Um, but if I have more than one cup of coffee a day, I, I, I kind of feel a bit um, a bit sick, a bit nauseous, so kind of just stick to the one. And are you a black or with cream and sugar? I'm actually fully milk. Um, I've always done that. That I like really milky coffee, so I don't even bother with the water. I just microwave some milk and put some coffee in it. Oh, wow. Some uh, little bit of instant coffee in it. Uh, well, that's a, a bit of a UK thing that most people drink instant. But um, I know, I know. I mean, my wife's from the US. She's from Philly, and she's obsessed with the coffee coffee on the in the pot type thing, you know. Oh, right, right, right. I was uh, just in England. I'm originally from uh, Silsden, which is a little village. Oh. Yeah, I know Silsden. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was just there last year on a bus trip, and uh, your breakfasts are strange. Not strange, but all the all the hotels had the same breakfasts, which was just different. You know, the fried tomatoes. Yeah, it's just the, the, it's just the, it's just the full English, isn't it? Where you can just get tomatoes and bacon and eggs and I don't know all that stuff. It's not that much different, apart from we to the American one. Apart from we use. Baked beans, you don't see that a lot in America, uh, you know. And the so, bacon, the bacon cuts are a lot different, I think. I forget. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't actually eat meat, but um, my wife doesn't like the bacon in England because she likes the thin, crispy stuff in, in America, you know. It's all good. Teach their own. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about your ethnic background, where you are from, where mm. you've spent most of your life, and what's kept you there. Uh, well, yeah, I was born in Halifax, West Yorkshire, which is uh, kind of an, uh, it used to be quite a rundown ex-industrial town in the north of England. Um, and, you, you know, a, a few people have sung songs about it and, and, and written poems about it. The green and the grey. It's basically a, a lot of old mills in a valley bet between two big green hills. And, uh, yeah, very working class, downtrodden attitude, like most of the north of England, um, that relies a lot on its, uh, its kind of self-depreciating sense of humour, which is, is, is something that ties a lot of the people there together, I suppose. And it's what's kept our band together, really, that upbringing and those surroundings, um, even though we all moved away to different corners of uh, the UK and the world, in fact, uh, we stayed together as a band primarily because of our upbringing, I think, and because of uh, this sense of humour I was talking about. The British sense of humour. Yeah, and even more so in the North. It's just it's just very, very dry and very self-depreciating and kind of, you know, you know, it's just very cutting. And uh, you'd never be, be allowed an ego in the, in the North of England because you just have it slapped out of you straight away, you know. Have you uh, delved much into your ancestry? Um, a little bit, a little bit, because with a name like Macintosh, and we have a, like a, that's my last name, uh, and we have a coat of arms and a tartan and stuff, you can't help but wonder about it. And um, when my granddad and my dad was alive, you know, I, I asked them a lot of questions about stuff and traced it. And yeah, it was part of this Macintosh Mackenzie clan out of, um, well, various parts of uh, Scotland, but Ullapool, or the Ullapool mainly, the north of, of Scotland. Was religion a big part of your upbringing? Absolutely not, um, fortunately, because um, I'm, I'm vehemently against uh, religion and especially the childhood indoctrination that it involves. You know, if people kept it to themselves, it wouldn't really bother me. Um, but because it's involved in, especially in America, in the state, in the laws, in in a lot of things, it, it just annoys me. So, no, no, I was quite fortunate that um, my mother and father didn't really give a toss. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I was forced to go to church at a very young age, but that was because, for some reason, everyone went to church and had to join the boys' brigade or the scouts or something. Um, and no one believed any of it. They just went there because it was expected of you, I think. Do you have a theory on why pedophilia is so prevalent in the Catholic Church? Um, I think it's when, uh, well, I mean, I think it's, it's people go into certain professions to, um, to I don't know, to, 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 I mean, it sounds horrible, but to, to get access to things like that. You know, you hear about it from people who work in certain children's services and, and scout leaders and stuff. So, so that being a, a priest in a Catholic church or a, 
some kind of high up person you would have access to um, that con that kind of control and that kind of uh, and and those kids vulnerable kids as well so maybe it's that or maybe it's just part of the suppression of um, you know suppressing that you know they're supposed to be celibate and all the rest of it um, so I, I don't know mixture of things maybe and the fact that it gets covered up by the highest levels so they can get away with it you know how did you first get into music was it what was your first introduction to real heavy metal um it was actually more through the punk scene um but sort of second wave of punk scene maybe in about 1981 82 um, my older brother was a punk and he had all the, this big record collection but it was kind of a mixture of punk new wave bit of metal bit of rock well metal in the sense of motorhead and stuff like that um, so yeah, I got into it through punk music, and then that eventually became crust punk, and eventually I got into metal and um, retrospectively listened to a lot of bands, I guess, as well. What was your first car or motorcycle? Ooh, it would have been something terrible. Um, first car. First car was probably something like a Vauxhall Viva or something, something they don't make <laughs> anymore. And it's probably in a gold colour, something that no one wants, you know. And motorcycle, are you a, are you a two-wheel enthusiast? I'm not, but it's weird because most of my friends are. But because I was always touring, I never I never really got round to it. It was one of those things in my 20s. I always said, right, I'm going to do the test. I'm going to do the test. And all my mates, because they worked kind of nine to five, as they, they just did the tests and got on with it. And yeah, I guess I'm, that's one of the things I, I missed out on that I should have pursued maybe earlier in life. But I guess never too late at some point, I guess. What is the most ridiculous thing you have ever heard about yourself and your band? Um, it once got reported that we were going to do an album that was techno, um, which was ridiculous. I think that was in Kerrang! magazine in the 90s at some point. Um, about myself, uh, I, oh, I, I had this society called the Vampire Society try and get me to join because they thought vampires were real. And they'd heard that I, I liked the concept of it. But they got it all completely wrong. I don't believe in any anything supernatural at all. It's, it's all cobblers, you know. But, I mean, um, I just <laughs> I just had an interest in some books and stuff and some movies, you know, horror movies and stuff. So they read it completely wrong. So they, I think maybe they thought I was some kind of vampiric uh, guy. But, no, absolutely not. Just a northern guy. Album number 16 came out on the 15th of this month. Mm -hmm. It's uh, nine, nine songs, uh, a little over 50, 45 minutes in length mm. with uh, stunning artwork. Talk a little bit about the art and how your relationship with Nuclear Blast has progressed over the years. Um, well, I mean, at the artwork first, I got in touch with them. Um, we had the idea to do this kind of, it's kind of a pre pre-christian pagan type artwork that was taken up again in kind of early victorian times and by a, and also used a lot in, by some of the early settlers in america this kind of uh symbolism and iconography that was used using good luck charms like nails and teeth and and uh raven you know birds and things like that so we had, we had that idea and then i got in touch with this guy called adrian baxter who specialized in that kind of thing and knew a lot about it and um and he just created this this amazing thing with lots of, and each little um, each little thing within the imagery all has its own little meaning. It was some talisman at some time, or it was some uh, something to ward off spirits or whatever. And right in the centre of the cover is the white rose of York, which is the symbol of Yorkshire, which mm. wasn't our idea. It was actually the artist's because, uh, unbeknownst to us, he was from Yorkshire. I thought it was an American guy, but um, he's also from Yorkshire. So there's a lot of it about. It must be spreading, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, a nuclear blast. I mean, it's 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 similar to um, we were on a label called Music for Nations in the '90s, and it's very similar to that. It's very uh, grassroots, uh, even though it's quite a big organisation. It's you're dealing with people who know the scene and are fans of the scene, and it's very easy to get on with. We've been on we've been on labels like EMI and BMG over the years, and it's you really do notice the difference when you're talking to people who know what they're know the scene rather than suits, if you know what I mean. It looks like the Digipack comes out with two additional songs that the Japanese don't even get. Hear the Night and Defiler. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, well, well, um, we didn't know 
what they which formats they were going to be used on we recorded it all as one big album you know like an 11 track album but when we were putting it the running order together we realized that the flow of the album worked perfectly with those nine songs that we used on there so the other two songs were then it was up to nuclear blast how they wanted to format it and use them and yeah sometimes they use tracks for japanese releases and sometimes they use it for other forms of formatting so that was really a decision by the record lab in the beginning you toured with bands such as bolt thrower and autopsy did you feel out of place at all not re not not especially i mean I, we got on with all those people as people and friends so we just felt welcomed and part of that scene um we'd all grown up in kind of either metal or punk scene in the uk in the mid 80s so we knew you know we all had similar backgrounds similar upbringing so we got on well but musically a little bit because we were the only band that played slow at that time everyone was trying to get faster than everyone else and we would do gigs and the audience would be shouting play play faster play faster and something in us just that northern stubbornness made us play even slower and uh that's kind of how our at the origins of our doom metal i guess you know the doom death thing and uh in america i lived in uh the bay area which i still was i'm still here in oakland uh the the live music scene particularly for the metal the heavier bands were uh the clubs all had these things called pay to play and uh where we had to pay the club two hundred dollars and they would give us tickets to sell with those tickets we could possibly make our money back or make some money yeah uh, but w either whatever the case was we had to give them you know two hundred dollars was, uh -huh. was that the scene was that uh prevalent in the scenes in england it wasn't something that we um were exposed to i mean i know the thing you're talking about um, it happened a little bit but it was mainly because you had these little promoters that were just you know somebody's friend or somebody's brother and they would pay the venue get the tickets and then give you the tickets to sell so it was kind of the same thing but you, we just it just wasn't as shoved in your face as, as a pay to play thing it was more like you'd be given these tickets to sell and you'd go and get them and you'd do it but it was more through a third party i see i see well, it still it still continues on to this day, uh, you know. It's it is the rock and roll, it is the music business after all. So, business is obviously number one in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose. Um, I mean, and it's going to have to adapt now because we don't know what's going to happen to live music, really. So, um, fingers crossed. Try and be optimistic about it, but it's not a it's not a good picture being painted at the moment. Yeah. Well, it used to be a tour would support an album. Then it mm -hmm. seemed to be that an album would support a tour, yeah. And uh, the the touring aspect of it has has gone by the wayside mm -hmm. by way of the corona. Yeah, it's just it's just. Uh, I mean, the, I I have weird conversations every day with the management and promoters and things about what they think the outcome is going to be, and no, nobody. The, the truth is, nobody knows, but. It'd be kind of surprising if it goes back to exactly how it was, um, which is is a daunting prospect that you're not going to be able to meet up with your friends in the same manner and you know and uh, and go go sh shows in sweaty clubs and things like that, which is was part of the fun or or the main part of the fun, you know. So so yeah, the scene's going to have to adapt to some degree. Or how how big that degree is, I don't know yet. Is Obsidian at all a continuation of Medusa? I um, mean, in one respect, I mean, when we first started the writing of it, um, the first song that you write is always kind of um, imprinted somehow by the last thing that you wrote. So you have this stepping stone song. And for us, it was the song Fall From Grace with, on the album, which was the first um, single, which was, you know, people heard from the album. And yeah, I guess stylistically, it's the closest in relation to the previous album Medusa but then we moved on and diversified and went down different paths um, so, so so that's kind of the connecting link there do you write within a particular time frame or, or just collect from random inspirations um, it's nice to have a little bit of a time frame so that you don't turn into a U2 type thing where you just you know just <laughs> 
doing really wanky things and not really getting on with the job. Um, but but usually, I mean, we give we give ourselves a year, and this time we did it in six months. So um, we, no one puts any pressure on us. It's pr- pressure on ourselves. We're kind of our own worst critics in a way, which which can help sometimes. You know, sometimes it can be detrimental, but. Um, but yeah, it, it helped us this time. We did the whole thing in six months from start to finish. So. What was the last riff of vocal melody that got stuck in your head? Of, of any band. Um, of, any, of any band or even a, a TV commercial. Um, it was a song, I don't know if you've heard of the new sci-fi series called Devs um, no. by, by Alex Garland, who wrote 28 Days Later and stuff like that. It's um, It's a quite a big production one i think it's an american production um sci-fi show and there's a song um that's in on that soundtrack um um and it's kind of a downbeat pop song very sad but a pop song nonetheless um and it's um it's called congregation um and i can't really remember the name of the band but it's going to be easy to find if you just type in Dev's congregation, and you'll you'll find it. It's, but um, then I looked the band up, and I didn't like any other songs by them. So that song's just a one-off song that I liked. You know. And your uh, your last was your last gig was in Mexico, or was it in Russia? It was Russia. We did a Russian tour. The last thing that we did, uh, um, no, and and we were supposed to go to Mexico, following that, and that was pretty much the day that the lockdown happened. We were supposed to fly there. So the decision was made not to, because then we wouldn't have been allowed back into uh, the UK. Have you uh, have you been have you been to Mexico before? Oh yeah, played there many times. Yeah, yeah. How does the Mexican festival? I would imagine pretty much most of the festivals are similar. Maybe maybe the food is better at one or or whatnot. I've heard that the health fest is pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean it all depends on the organisation. And how much the promoter cares about the bands as well as the fans, and the, and how much he cares about money. Because some some big festivals have kind of become too uh, materialistic and care more about printing napkins with their logo on than they do about feeding the bands, etc. Um, but yeah, a festival like Hellfest is enormous, yet it still kind of ticks all the boxes. Um, and grass pop in Belgium. There's, there's, there's quite a few that are very well organised big festivals, you know. And uh, just a few more questions. How has the writing uh, and recording process changed from album to album within the last decade? And do you, do you I think you do set a time limit on perfection. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the way it's changed in the last decade is we've taken on more of it ourselves. As, as I guess, me, uh, you know, experience and music technology has provided. Um, I, I built my own studio about two years ago um, with well, its own live room and stuff. So a lot of the guitars on this record I recorded myself, whilst other things were being recorded in another studio. So that kind of cuts down your time restraints, constraints, sorry, um, and frees you up and helps, help, gives you more time to experiment with sounds, I guess, and, and, and things. But... We're always quite well prepared when we go into a studio anyway, so we, we never take too long. How familiar are you with modern day mythology, such as uh, Abominable Snowman, QAnon and UFOs? Uh, well, um, I wouldn't call UFOs mythology. I'd, uh, um, I don't know what I'd place that in, just unexplained. Um, Abominable Snowman, I would probably call, call a bit of mythology or folklore. Um, yeah, I'm aware of it all. I'm aware of it all. And especially in lockdown, you start to read conspiracy theories and get a bit wrapped up in it. Um, but I'm a pretty big science guy. I read a lot of science books and history books. And uh, I think humans are, uh, are predisposed to looking for things um, out of the extraordinary that they can't explain and try to explain it through paranormal or supernatural means. And usually there's a scientific explanation that maybe it's just because our our technology hasn't caught up with that yet.